Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities, the youngest newly founded institute of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Well, as we were only founded last year, I should like, before we uh, get down to brass tucks, to say a few words about our new institute and our lecture series as part of which this is, event is going to take place to put everything in a somewhat larger context. The Austrian Center for Digital Humanities was set up with the declared goal of fostering digital methods in the various fields of the humanities. The center is active in a number of areas. We support our fellow researchers by working on digital infrastructures, developing technical services, hosting and publishing digital data, developing software, and working on ways of efficient knowledge transfer from our narrow community to the humanities research community at large by offering advice and guidance in a wide range of digital humanities issues. Apart from providing infrastructure services, the ACDH also pursues research in various fields of the digital humanities. In the past, our team has been working on text and language related questions, focusing in their research on non-standard and historical linguistic varieties, digital archeology, span ancient history, and e-lexicography. Current projects investigate innovative technical infrastructure components, digital standards, digital language resources, and semantic technologies. All of these activities have been embedded in the European Infrastructure Consortia Clarin Eric and Daria Eric. Over the past few years, the colleagues have been actively participating in these initiatives by developing core infrastructure components and by contributing to a number of important initiatives such as Clarin's Federated Content Search Working Group or Daria's Virtual Competency Center. What all of this is about is digital humanities, of course, which we regard as part of a profound social transformation. Digital humanities imply new methods, new questions, and hopefully new answers to old questions. Digital humanities have got to do with technology, but not only with technology. Our much wider understanding of technology-enhanced research in social sciences, cultural studies, and humanities has got to do with innovation and has a strong social component. For us, digital humanities means combining digital and social infrastructures, means inter- and transdisciplinary approaches. The second one is particularly important. By trans, we mean we do not only think of what is happening inside our communities, but we want to reach beyond that. We want to reach into society, which I think is a quite a natural thing when you work with digital methods. Uh, another important thing are collaborative methods and participative technologies. And the whole range, of course, of open approaches, such as open data, open access, and open source, with respect both to research results but also to research data. The ACTH has been founded with the express goal of fostering and furthering the cause of the digital humanities. As such, the ACTH is also an educational mission to disseminate the new methods of our community of practice and to support digitally working uh, researchers in their endeavors. To this end, we started two new types of information roadshows last year. The first format 
we have called the ACD lectures, and today you are participating in one such lecture. The second format is the ACDH tool gallery. The, the idea for the second type of event has grown out of a, sorry, has grown out uh, of a great need in skills to use new and innovative tools and services and an institutional lack of opportunities to acquire such skills. Our new series of workshops combines morning lectures given by proven experts in the field with hands-on practical sessions in the afternoon in which participants are given the opportunity to interact with the tools and methods to do something practical themselves. ACDH lectures. Oops, this way. The ACDH lecture series uh, feature outstanding international scholars capable of inspiring the next generation of researchers and convincing them of the usefulness, validity, and innovative strength of digital humanities, of their new methods and approaches. These are the lectures we already had. Uh, let me draw your attention to our next lecture, not the one of today, but the next one coming up on 20th of April, uh, when we will have here uh, uh, at the Academy in Sonnenfelsgasse, Keith Baker from Stanford University talking to us about uh, looking for revolution in the data pool, which to my mind also sounds quite, quite interesting. If you want to know more about all of this, you're kindly invited to visit our homepage under this address. Uh, we have a Digital Humanities Austria mailing list to which you might subscribe if you want to have regular information and don't hesitate to get directly in touch with us. As I mentioned before, digital humanities means to collaborate, means to do things together. And that's why I step aside now and give the floor to Professor Rösner from the Academy's uh, Department uh, Institute of, uh, now I have to concentrate, cultural studies and his theatre history uh, to introduce our esteemed guest. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Mert, and uh, thank you, uh, members of our newborn baby, which uh, was presented now uh, to you, uh, the Austrian Center of Digital Humanities. I'm very glad that uh, in your, uh, let's say, Bible of uh, ethics, you have presented to us there is the transdisciplinary uh, approach, uh, which... For the moment, it was uh, just my institute uh, who really def defended it against uh, many uh, ideas that we should not be more than interdisciplinary, so put things uh, <coughs> one besides the other, but to look beyond, and I'm, I'm very happy that we share this uh, idea. But uh, most of all, I'm, I'm very grateful to you to, uh, for giving me the occasion, the opportunity to present to you Professor Jeffrey Schnapp and uh, uh, for having, having given me the opportunity to know him personally uh, because I, uh, I can really uh, say it is uh, worthwhile and I'm very happy that you are here to listen to him. Um, I mean, Jeffrey Schnapp is uh, on one hand, I would say, uh, something you have to know when uh, you are uh, a scholar of Romance philology, as I am. <clears throat> but uh, most of these people we know just as names uh, on uh, the book covers. Uh, and it's always uh, something uh, very interesting uh, to get uh, nearer to a name on a book cover and discover what is behind this name. Uh, we could start with that. We could start with the book covers, and I could uh, tell you that uh, Professor Schnapp uh, <clears throat> was uh, uh, at the beginning uh, an important dentist. So 
He was a specialist in Italian literature, he was a specialist in medieval literature, and he was even a specialist in <coughs> this author of medieval literature where you have to uh, look very carefully to find still a niche where you can uh, write something new because the problem with Dante is that uh, already Dante himself and the generation afterwards uh, started to write about uh, his Divina Commedia. And so <coughs> when uh, Professor Schnapp published uh, his uh, transfiguration of history at the center of Dante's paradise, uh, there were uh, at least uh, seven centuries uh, of uh, Dante liturgy he had to, um, <coughs> to eat up uh, to, um, let's say, to, to consider uh, in order to write something. So uh, when we look at his early work, we have to say he's a very distinguished scholar uh, in the tradition, the good tradition of Roman philology and, and especially of medieval Italian philology. But <coughs> as he is not only that, um, it sometimes gets bored when you're always uh, looking for niches in uh, a very restricted field. So <clears throat> he started to do, um, at the first moment, uh, let's say the opposite in time. Uh, he started to get interested in 20th century literature that was still in the 20th century. So it was uh, his own century he got interested in. And uh, he dedicated a lot of uh, his interest to uh, Italian and uh, afterwards European literature uh, of the avant-garde period um, around the years of fascism in, in Italy in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, from dealing with literature, with Italian literature of the 1930s, he, he got a little bit uh, more beyond, let's say. On one hand, uh, he started to write also about authors who are not uh, object of Romance literature studies, as Hugo Ball, for instance. On the other hand, he <coughs> got to write about persons who are not even the object of literary studies at all. Uh, <coughs> architects, uh, designers, builders. <coughs> and uh, on the same t at the same time, <coughs> as he told me, <coughs> he <coughs> was one of uh, the pioneers of uh, information technology uh, at a moment when information technology was still something for outsiders. <clears throat> so he started to become interested also in things which had nothing to do with philology or even culture studies in the traditional way. And I think that's the reason why he's here today, no? uh, because he's obviously one of the people who started uh, to deal with uh, digital humanities when the the concept of digital humanities uh, still did not exist. Uh, and what he did was uh, that he, um, he was one of the founders, uh, or even the founder, of uh, Humanities Lab at Stanford University. And then when he went from Stanford uh, to another uh, rather important university as Harvard is, uh, <clears throat> he brought with him the ideas from Stanford and uh, he built up a new lab, an even more, <coughs> let's say, uh, innovational lab <coughs> at Harvard University. <coughs> and uh, when I was called to present him, I think it was uh, due more to my uh, training as a scholar in Romans philology than to my computational uh, capacities, because uh, <coughs> they are quite limited. <clears throat> even, in, even if in Munich, as I told him, uh, for some times I was, had also the reputation to be a computer expert, but that was due to the fact that when I came to Munich, <clears throat> there were a little, let's say, a, an old generation of professors who thought that computers uh, could be dangerous and didn't want to have them in their offices. <clears throat> so when I asked for a computer, they said, oh, really want these terrible things? Uh, so please uh, have mine, I don't want it in, in my office. And so I could uh, get nearer to computers at a time when in Munich it was not normal. But uh, I wouldn't say that I have the, uh, the slightest idea about 
the complexity of the, the information technology Jeffrey uh, will bring to us this evening. So I just leave the floor for him uh, and ask you to listen to him. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, both to Michael, Karl Heinz, uh, to the Austrian um, Center for Digital Humanities, to all of you for joining um, with me uh, today. Um, and uh, basically, what I'm going to present to you <clears throat> is um, actually a, a direct extension of the very generous introduction you just heard from uh, Professor Rosner. Um, in a sense, it's a, a, a little bit of an autobiographical narrative that uh, will take you through what I really understand not as a, 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 I mean, the label digital humanities tends to suggest that there's this field that has come about that has recognizable contours, that has all the attributes of a discipline. And in, in some ways, that's true. And it, but in other ways, it's very much a work in progress. And I think one of the exciting features about this domain is that it's both very old and very new. Uh, and that its boundary lines are actually very much in the process of constant redefinition. Um, and my own experience working not just in the interstices between digital media, computational techniques on the one side, and on the other side, different areas of cultural history. I consider myself a cultural historian, even though I was trained as a literary historian. Um, not just in between, but in the collisions between those two domains, is um, that uh, we're really just at the bare beginnings of a conversation about how the availability of uh, both digital platforms, uh, digital tools, uh, analytical tools, computational tools, and these very venerable disciplinary areas that represent uh, the whole mix of disciplines that make up the modern university, what it actually means to place those in dialogue, in a profound dialogue that's transformative on both sides of the divide, I might add. So um, the top, the, what I'd like to start with is just talking a little bit about the nature of the label digital humanities. And I, I, I'm not the only one who has a very uh, sort of, I would say, complex relationship to this label because I can remember an era in my own practice where um, this was not the label that was used. Uh, the rea in reality, this conversation between computation and the humanities has been happening since uh, certainly the end of World War II. Um, and back in the good old, the bad old days of early conversations or collisions between computational methods and um, the uh, different areas of the humanities, there were many, many labels that circulated. Computing in the humanities, humanities informatics, uh, uh, humanities computing, and just as a sort of self-revealing gesture, this is me uh, back in 1983. That's, I, I had a different hairdo uh, back then. Um, working, working on the first project that was a nationally funded project in the United States, which is called the Dartmouth-Dante Project. It exists to this day. It's a reference tool that's used by scholars in the community of, uh, of Dante studies. Um, and um, we are sit sitting there in front in the uh, computer center of Dartmouth College, which was one of the, the, the avant-garde universities in the United States in terms of the development of campus-wide uh, computer systems. Uh, the, some of the earliest examples of email being used to communicate within a university are from Dartmouth. So Dartmouth had this, and, and the reason for that I should mention is that the creator of BASIC, the programming language, John uh, Kemeny was the president of Dartmouth and he had these very, what were considered really exotic, strange ideas that somehow computation was gonna be an essential piece of the larger transformations that university, uh, universities were undergoing uh, at the time. And um, in any case, at the computer center we had this fantastic, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge machine, which was called a Kurzweil scanner. Now, the Kurzweil scanner is that huge machine right there. That machine can do amazing, magical tasks that you can carry out on your smartphone right now, which is to say it could actually not just scan a page, but it, it was actually at a, a, a staggering, uh, kind of vertiginous accuracy rate around 50% could recognize characters on the page. And that student you see sitting there was trying to do something that this machine was not designed to do, which was to read printed text 
that predated the 20th century. Um, because one of the interesting things about, in my, as, as, um, as Professor Rosner was kind enough to note, uh, about the, my point of departure as a scholar was, I, I was principally interested and concerned with uh, working on D Dante Alighieri's relationship to the culture of the vi visual arts of his own context. I worked on manuscripts, but I was also interested in what the, um, the sort of visual cultural environment around Dante, what I its impact was on his way of imagining scenes of his, within his representation of the other world, of the afterlife. Um, but what's distinctive about Dante's poem, it's actually unique in the history of Western literature up until Dante's time, is that from the very time that Dante released the canticles of the Commedia, people started writing line-by-line -line commentaries, the way that they wrote line-by-line -line commentaries of Virgil, or of Horace, or of Ovid, or especially of sacred texts. And starting with Dante's own sons, who are the authors of some of the earliest commenta commentaries, line-by-line -line commentaries on the Divine Comedy, we have a continuous history of reading for seven centuries, from the time of the completion of the, of the Paradiso to the present. A computer scientist's dream. <laughs> totally indexed corpus, pegged word by word, line by line. And therefore, in 1983, when I was an assistant professor at Dartmouth, we started this project of thinking we have the perfect database. We can create a tool that does all those really boring tasks that scholars in the field do, spending days, weeks, put, looking, comparing the history of the reception of particular difficult passages and so forth. Except for one problem. Scanning machines couldn't read most of these texts. Many of the editions go back to the Encanabula era of printing. Uh, and even 16th and 17th century editions were almost impossible to scan. Um, but that, that, those were technical problems. And over the course of this project, we learned how to trick the tech to, to actually use the, the Kurzweil scanners in ways that they were never designed to do by using all kinds of optical tricks. And we eventually got them to read 18th century books. And today this project is complete. All seven centuries are gathered together. So why have I told you this story? At the end of this process, by well, basically the end of my involvement in the project, 1985, I actually was not, um, I have to say I was disappointed by the impact that the creation of this tool had because what it wasn't doing is changing the research questions around the poem. What it had done is made very easy to do something that from a research standpoint was essential, but it was only the beginning of a process of energizing the field of Dante studies. To be able to carry out an operation that, you can, that takes weeks of time in a few minutes, of course, is a great leap forward, you might say, but it's not a sufficient leap forward. And uh, a number of years would pass between this time and when digital humanities comes about as a label. It's a, largely in the late 1990s, early 2000s that this label starts to circulate. Um, something happened, and, and it certainly brought me back to feeling really passionate and excited about the challenges and the opportunities for starting a new conversation between the world of digital media computation and um, uh, cultural history. Um, one of those changes is the World Wide Web, its emergence as a public space, as a communication space, as a, in a sense the defining public space of contemporary society. The second is personal computing, the revolution in personal computing itself. And the third, of course, is the increasing ways in which smart devices have changed the way in which we interact with both media and data. And the kind of reshuffling, if you like, of the relationship between what were once these very space-bound, place-specific devices that were workstations and this new world of mobility, mo of social mobility, of exchange, of communication, that the proliferation of smart devices brings about. So digital humanities is a label that's useful. It's a powerful label precisely because it begins to capture a moment that's a very distinctive historical moment. It's not the moment of informational, of, 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 uh, com of humanities informatics or computing in the humanities. It's a new kind of collision, a new set of possibilities. And um, 
I actually have written a book with the title, Digital Underscore Humanities. You, the underscore is very important, but I'll come back to that if we want to discuss that. <laughs> um, but I also have, feel very nervous about the label for two reasons, and I don't actually like either word in this title. I don't like digital, and I, I'm not sure I like humanities either, and let me explain that <laughs> um, by way of a provocation. Uh, the digital, I, I, I feel nervous about because it tends to assign too much, uh, too much agency to the digital per se, as if the arrival of digital media or of co computational tools did something to the humanities, like it was the actor, when I, I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of the exciting work that's going on actually is not at all just reducible to the use of computational tools or analytics or whatever, but rather it's really about a rethinking or an expanding of ha contours or uh, it's, it involves uh, basically something more than just simply the application of an instrument to an existing set of problems. The word humanities, as powerful and resonant as it is, also suggests that we know what field we're operating in. And the taxonomy of disciplines that we inherited from the German university system of the late 19th century is often at odds with the realities of experimentation and practice that are happening today, precisely enabled by digital media and by uh, the rise of, of computing. So I struggle with this issue a lot. I think it's a very valuable label. Um, but in my own group, the, the lab that I run at Harvard, the Meta Lab, um, we we don't call it, we don't have the word digital in our title. <laughs> we have a deliberately um, oracular, sibylline name, precisely because really the digital is about the analog. It's about expanding the compass of our experience. It's about intensifying our relationship to the world. So it's these are not separate realms. They're realms that are profoundly interconnected and the most rich expressions of digital humanities, in my view, are very much about that recoupling of uh, this reshaping of experiences, whether it's of a literary corpus or uh, an, an artistic corpus or a model of communication or teaching. So, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of these elements. When I think of digital humanities, the, the, and, and in fact, I think this was evoked already in the, uh, in the prefatory remarks today, these are some of the values that one typically associates. So, an increasing importance on collaboration, forms of cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary collaboration in particular. Certainly, um, uh, the borrowing, if you like, of some of the practices that we associate with spaces like, like laboratories, uh, in other words, experimental practice. Um, uh, there, there's many, many other items I could go through here. I'm just going to pull out the ones that are important to what I'm going to say later. Um, one of them is that um, as a medieval historian by training, I'm really happy when I can, uh, can track a phenomenon, study a phenomenon with any kind of focus, with any kind of level of granularity, down to the scale of, you know, years, decades, typically. Um, and of course, what is that historical record that one studies almost for any epoch of history? Well, it's what survives. And what has survived in the case of most forms of, most eras of cultural history is the textual record, uh, whether it's manuscripts or it's printed records or other kinds of materials or the pictorial um, remains of different eras. But starting around the year 1900, culture has a soundtrack. We have other kinds of forms of, re of memory that are preserved, and increasingly, certainly, the ubiquity of photography through uh, you know smartphones and so forth, but much more broadly, environmental sound, not just music, but all kinds of forms of recorded sound, represents an, a great augmentation of our possibilities of thinking about the nature of historical uh, reconstruction, memory, etc. So, not surprisingly, I think a lot of digital humanities work has gravitated toward those domains that where we don't have deep traditions the way that we have deep traditions in text, textual studies or um, in certain areas of visual culture. Um, and I think that's a really exciting horizon. So, sound studies have been completely reinvigorated. So, that extends also to forms of culture in the Middle Ages. We know that the vast majority of medieval culture was performed. It was live. It was not text-based. And that was true particularly for vernacular culture. Uh, that is 
a puzzle you can only reconstruct laterally through the textual remains. And so starting in the 1900s, but accelerating through the end of the 20th century, we suddenly have such a rich set of forms of capture and documentation of all kinds of forms of performing arts, of live, evanescent culture, that I think these are particular domains that I think the digital humanities can really blaze a path and create new models of, uh, of uh, representation, uh, argument, documentation, new models of what it is to archive an event, for example, um, that pose interesting technical challenges as well as conceptual challenges. The other area I want to mention is that when you think of the question, the question I'm going to come to in a second, which is the fundamental question for me of the, the version of digital humanities that interests, engages me the most, uh, which is what does knowledge look like or what should it look like? What could it look like in the 21st century? Well, in the 20th century, we pretty much know what the answer to that is and it takes the form of a book, right? Uh, a published, a, uh, a printed document. Um, that, of course, books are tremendously powerful um, as vehicles for conveying, sharing, uh, preserving knowledge. But of course, they also have certain kinds of challenges. Like every medium, they have limitations. They have weak weaknesses and strengths side by side. One of the things that the um, emergence of uh, this world of multi-channel communications, including uh, obviously the centrality of, we of the web as a platform for the dissemination of information, knowledge, media, is that we have the opportunity to think about audiences, about public, about who audience, who, who knowledge serves in ways that are uh, innovative, powerful, and are not reducible simply to the notion of, you know, haute divulgation or, you know, uh, distributing knowledge, watering it down for the masses. No, we can think about very high-powered, rigorous forms of scholarship that actually speak and, 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 and engage audiences that will never pick up a specialized monograph or uh, read a specialized journal. And for me, the digital humanities has the opportunity to be a place of invention around this theme. So what I'm gonna talk about today, and, um, and these are values that my lab at Stanford, which I started in 1999 and ran through 2009 when I left uh, for uh, Harvard, um, was putting into place. We were focused really on three areas broadly. The question of what an archive is or should be today. I'm gonna come back to that. The question of what we like to call big humanity, sort of like big science, like what would it be like if instead of working in a kind of craft-based method like we have traditionally worked as humanists, accumulating knowledge, producing it individually, we were to put forms of expertise together to build bigger pictures, to ask bigger questions, to change the scale, if you like, of the questions that we ask. And the third area was developing humanities-specific models of uh, collaboration and uh, teamwork. So, in trying to hunt around for a label that would go alongside digital humanities. One of the ones I've played around with is this idea of knowledge design. And I'll try to explain what I, what I imagine knowledge design uh, to be. But if knowledge design is anything, it answers this question, which I already anticipated. Namely, what does knowledge look like in the 21st century? We know what it looked like in the 20, 20th century. It was associated with the medium of print. Of course, there are many other forms of knowledge. I'm not suggesting that print was the only answer to the question, but print was the anchor for the whole structure, the whole edifice uh, of uh, knowledge uh, production and dissemination. Um, and of course, does is not necessarily the right word. It's also could. What could knowledge look like? What would be the most interesting? How, what, what's the, what are the forms of scholarship that we dream of? Uh, uh, what are the forms that we would want to, to dream up or to, to create? Um, so, knowledge design, if it's an, a field I've invented, <laughs> I'll say that openly, but it's a field that's meant as a provocation for thinking that um, there's no question that I, I myself and my collaborators, we come out of tradition, different traditions of inquiry within the humanities and social sciences, typically, and we're shaped by the research questions and by the forms of rigor and the standards of those fields, but we also are really interested in being the incubator for new forms, uh, seeing what they look like and failing many times. Um, and so some of these questions that I think are the interesting, for me at least, the areas that excite me, 
One of them has to do with this question of new genres and forms of scholarly practice. Uh, um, we're, we know what the traditional forms are, but um, those forms themselves are the product of a very specific historical evolution. So what are the forms of today and tomorrow? The forms that um, excite us, that offer us opportunities to expand the compass of the arguments we make, to open up new fields of inquiry. So I'm gonna talk about one example such. A second area is this question of how we embed the digital and the an in the analog. Uh, we are spatial creatures. All of the forms of knowledge exchange, all the institutions that we animate um, are in, in some fundamental way connected to our activities in space, our interactions face to face and so forth. So how do we make digital a world that is saturated with data, most of it trivial, but sometimes important and transformative and significant? How do we make it matter? What kinds of, for example, let me take a, a very concrete example, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, what does an, a learning space look like in the 21st century? We know what bad examples are. If you go to the reading room of every library in the world today, it's filled with workstations, with screen after screen after screen. It looks like a tobacco factory in the 19th century with people rolling cigars, you know. Um, is that a social space? Is that an inter interactive space in any meaningful or non-trivial way? No, it isn't. It's, uh, it's, a, an after, it's an accommodation of existing physical space to the importance of screens as the devices through which we participate in all kinds of virtual communities. But surely as designers and as people who are imaginative thinkers about these kinds, and as experts, we can come up with better designs, more interesting ideas, what a library looks like, what a reading room looks like in, in the 21st century. A third area is the question, this is gonna sound a little bit perverse, but so what does print, now that we have this extraordinary proliferation of ways of communicating knowledge as it's being produced, when it's complete, uh, watching the emergence of a research project, watching its uh, extension into other projects. Now that this process can be a process, not just a product, because print, of course, is a very product-oriented medium. It finalizes, it, it, it stabilizes a, a, a set of data. What do we do with print today? What do we want scholarly books to do? Uh, are they just gonna go away? I don't think so. Print has an incredibly rich history of transformation it's not just a straight path from Gutenberg to the present. So how might we reimagine the role of print culture in a world where we have this proliferation of channels? Do print artifacts converge? Do they overlap? Uh, you know, if you look at the you know, history of eBooks, for example, it's mostly a kind of backward looking replication of the design features of print culture, but there's no reason why eBooks should look like that. eBooks could be something completely different. So what are those new forms? Um, how might we reimagine print? Um, next theme, and this is gonna be a theme I'm gonna come back to uh, repeatedly, the question of arguments, of scales of argument. One of the things that computers are, are very bad at certain things, but they're very good at others. What they're, they're not so good at is capturing nuance, qualitative distinctions, uh, those kinds of fine points where it's absolutely essential to have a deep knowledge of context or of culture uh, or of uh, historical circumstance. They're incredibly good at dealing with very, very massively scaled information sets that are well structured, well articulated, or well architected in a kind of database sense. Now, as in the humanities fields, our traditions are qualitative generally. Uh, the history of quantitative humanities is about this big. Um, and those quantitative traditions have a kind of forms of attention and rigor and criticality that are, I think, core values of the humanities. But if we can put together those skills with the power that, uh, that, that uh, computational tools allow us to scale up to macro scales that are way beyond the capabilities of an individual scholar, uh, we have something new. It's something unfamiliar, which is how do we make arguments that zoom back and forth between this sort of usual small scale, middle scale, meso or micro scale that is the typical uh, the typical dimension of humanities research to scales where we're talking not about 
a thousand objects or 10,000 objects. We're talking about sometimes millions of objects. Uh, this is a new horizon. I think it's a really exciting horizon, um, but it involves uh, rethinking what we, how we make, tell stories, how we make arguments and so forth. And um, that point is also related to what I like to call institutional portraiture because as I'm gonna show you uh, a couple of examples of, if we can take the um, inventories that have been created by the great knowledge institutions that are uh, the pillar of structures like universities and museums and archives, namely library catalogs, co collections, inventories, and we can leverage them to tell stories, to do things, to become the laboratory where the humanist does his or her research, we can show things about institutions that institutions don't know about themselves because we can see so many objects in relation to one another in a way that's different from the traditional ways that we think about a museum or a collection or a library or human knowledge for that matter. Um, I already talked a little bit about the sensorium that represents the field of cultural history and the potential for expanding it. Um, I mentioned smart devices and pot their potential role for changing our relationship to knowledge for in a sense bringing forms of scholarship out of the, s the library stacks, out into the streets, into the physical environment. Um, and uh, this is a point that's gonna be central to everything I say. The whole question of data. Data is um, the clay, it's the marble of the 21st century. And human humanists have to be involved in sculpting it and shaping it, just like computer scientists do. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be able to tell the kinds of stories that fulfill the ambitions of what I've been talking about here. So um, at, at MetaLab, we struggle with this question a lot of who are we? How do we define ourselves? We're definitely a digital humanities center. I'm not suggesting the contrary, but we like to play around. In fact, we probably do it excessively. Uh, it's probably a bit narcissistic, but trying to think about how do we want to define ourselves in terms of the world? And, and our most recent self-formulation is that we call ourselves a concept foundry, a knowledge design lab, and a pr production studio. So it's, that's, a, that's a mouthful, but, but basically, by Concept Foundry, what I mean is what I was talking about before in terms of trying to experiment with new genres of scholarly argument and knowledge. Uh, knowledge Design Studio, or Knowledge Design Lab, is again, trying to answer this question of what the shapes that knowledge, uh, forms of scholarship, forms of cultural argument, forms of even creative practice could assume in 21st century circumstances. And the third, Production Studio is we make stuff. Like we make stuff, like we make physical stuff and we make, we build, uh, we code and we, um, we build interactives uh, and we think it's important to make stuff because you learn certain things by making things in the world that you do not learn uh, when you're sitting at a remove from the world of practice. And we believe that that's a, a real plus in our own process. And I wanna come back to this issue of data of the nature of data and why data is important for, I think, the digital humanities and also for the future of the humanities, which is that, you know, if we leave, you know, data abstract, just like every system of indexation, every system of description, they abstract features of the world to make it legible, to make it, to simplify it, to standardize it. This is not a new problem, it's a very old problem. It's just that it exists on a scale today that transcends the scale of uh, uh, certainly earlier centuries, but any librarian can tell you a lot about the way in which data and data architecture has a very long history that goes back well into the uh, uh, pre-modern period. But in our era, it's important to underscore that raw data themselves don't do anything. Uh, data need to be sculpted. And uh, I think one of the important challenges in the humanities is for people humanists, young humanists in particular, to develop an, an understanding at least. It does, it's not about becoming programmers. Not everybody needs to be a, a second-rate JavaScript programmer or whatever. It's more important that people have a, a, an understanding of what data is and how one shapes data and how one makes shapes data into meanings, arguments. Uh, and uh, the other point that's essential as part of that crafting process is that increasingly data is cultural heritage that we, if we are the guardians of cultural heritage, if we are the interpreters of cultural heritage, we have to be in the data business. We cannot choose to step to outside of that. And these are all arguments that the digital underscore humanities book 
makes in a number of different ways. And in, in the course of the examples I'm going to show you right now, I'm, um, I'm going to take some chapters from this book just to, and, and to illustrate them through forms of practice. And again, the question that I'm interested in here is this question about form, uh, about genre, about expression, uh, about what are some of the models that are interesting models. Uh, and um, some of these pro projects I'm going to show you are failed projects uh, or they are early development projects. They're thought bubbles, you might say, less than completed projects. And I think it's important for the future of the humanities that risk taking and uh, narratives of failure become part of the logic of experimentation and innovation. And I think we have a tendency to be a little bit too risk averse, but it's important. So I'm gonna look at four, four areas. One, the question of what an archive is today, what an archive could be or should be, especially as the very notion of archive has undergone a transformation over the course of the last 15, 20 years. The second is um, the question of, uh, of weaving together information and space, uh, what it means to have located access to uh, networks, to data. Uh, the third is what I alluded to earlier as print. What happens to print in the digital era? What do we want print to do that it could do before, but, but for other reasons, it had other responsibilities, other duties. And uh, the final one is um, this whole question of the expressive potential of data. And that's gonna be a, a pretty sustained theme in everything that I say from, from here on out. So, so let's start with uh, the question of the archive. And back in the Stanford Humanities Lab days, as you noticed, we like to talk about animated archives. Obviously, that was meant to provoke our colleagues in the archive business to say, you know, archives are not really about storage. <laughs> the real meaning of archives has to do with how they come to life through living communities that engage with those materials. So what if we reframe the question about archiving, uh, preserving the record, of humankind around the question of animation, of how we bring those records to life in one form or another. And I'm gonna show you just one example, and this is gonna be very brief because this is something you can see online. Um, this is an experimental archive that uh, Metalab uh, designed for the Reischauer Center for Japanese Studies in, um, at Harvard. So when the 311 earthquakes happened in Japan, uh, many institutions throughout the world thought, you know, this is an event this, with the tsunami and the after effects, the nuclear accident. This is an event that is going to continue to shape the, not just the landscape of the immediate vicinity of the accident, but the entire region for decades and decades and decades. It's a historical event. We need to document it. How are we going to document it? Um, and uh, the question was, uh, originally, when we first started, my colleagues first started thinking about this, like many of their colleagues worldwide, they thought, well, we'll do what archivists have done over the centuries. We'll put all the documents in a box. <laughs> we'll gather them together, which is, of course, a rather momentous task, and we'll try to make sure we have the most complete set possible. But, of course, the question is, what are those documents in the year 2011? Well, I don't need to tell you what the answer to that is, but a lot of those documents were on a device like this, in the pocket of people all over the region who were the victims of the accident. Not, the, the documents weren't in government ministries necessarily. They were on web pages that are changing every hour in terms of the, you know, the, the stories that they carry. They were on all kinds of channels. They were in text messages. They were in tweets. They were, uh, of course, in traditional print documents as well. So the, the real question in designing an archive today, especially an archive of an event that will, in a sense, not be complete for decades because the nuclear consequences, for example, uh, the radiation co consequences of the accident are ongoing and, and, and will be ongoing for some time, it was really to rethink the nature of what an archive itself is. And if you go to the, um, this archive, you can explore this for yourself. But one of the things that it tries to do is, first of all, this is a distributed archive. No party owns the archive, so to speak. There are 20 plus partners, including from the private sector, Flickr Japan, decided to become the collector of photographic resources. The National Library of Japan collected all of the traditional print and other kinds of media. Um, Internetarchive.org in San Francisco 
decided to host the tweets. We have eight, I think it's eight million tweets that document um, down to a scale, by the way, of tens of seconds, the unfolding of the event. We have uh, the University, I think it's the University of Virginia that hosts uh, the uh, archive of web pages that through a crawler that goes, has gone back and excavated basically web pages in Japan and throughout the world documenting the disaster. And the website itself has a testimonial box where people who are witnesses or people who want to tell part of the story can actually add a piece to the archive. All of these resources only exist together, stitched together through a web portal. They don't exist, that's the, that's the edifice of the archive. And every act of interpretation, every curatorial act, every time a user sees a relationship between objects from all of these different media types and puts them together in a tray as part of a kind of collecting gesture, that itself becomes part of the archive. That somebody saw meaning in a set of relationships. My point being is that this is a different kind of archive. It's an archive that's generated from the bottom up that uh, where many of the traditional kinds of classification, uh, uh, ordering process processes are dist massively distributed. Uh, and uh, it, I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One reason is that it offers an, a transformative possibility vis-a-vis -vis the question, a fundamental question for all public institutions of memory, which is who is an archive for? I mean, if archives are just for scholars who are going to come 50 or 100 years later to study a, a problem, there's a very significant social cost. We all know the debates around s public support of these kinds of institutions. Well, in this case, this is an archive where the biggest user population already, right from the, this isn't an archive that took 20 years to classify. It was immediately accessible, and most of the user population was either victims of the disaster, who wanted to tell stories about it, who wanted to tap into the resources that had been collectively assembled, or journalists, people making arguments about uh, the, the tsunami, or planning, or some feature. So the point I'm trying to make is that by expanding the compass of and the ways in which archi an archive is put together, one has also transformed its social function and turned it into a memory platform and turned it into a, a platform for debate and uh, all kinds of forms of, of uh, uh, sort of engagement that are not the traditional expectation that we have in terms of the time horizon. And there's one last thing, which if we went to the site, I could show you, and that is that I can now do, uh, perform research operations that are on a time scale that is completely different than any archive you've ever seen before. So if I wanna know what happened during a two minute period after the earthquake, but before this, you know, uh, let's say the, you know, the first reports of damage. Um, I can track that with thousands and thousands of objects. That's quite interesting. That's very different as a form of memory than the traditional ways in which we document an event. Uh, and um, I leave it to you to think about the question of how that might change how the things we do. And um, we've worked on a couple of other platforms to try to do similar things. I'm gonna show you uh, one example, if this will let me do it actually, I'm gonna jump out here and go to, all right, um, to Corarium. Okay, so Corarium is a very diff different example, but um, with Corarium what we've been trying to do is a, a slightly different approach, which is to take museum collections, the databases that were uh, constructed for different kinds of collections, but also collections that haven't been fully processed, that have been partially processed, and to use those um, database uh, uh, um, assets in ways that begin to offer different communities of expert users, but also uh, members of the public, the opportunity to see collections as aggregates, to see thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of objects simultaneously. So I'm just gonna give you an example. It's a, it's a, it's a different, obviously very different kind of emphasis than that of the Japan archive. But here, for example, we're looking at um, uh, Asian and Mediterranean, uh, and, uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean art. And by using the color analytics, uh, kind of automated color analytics, we can actually show you the map of all of these objects together 
um, classified by color, not by date or provenance or, uh, or we can look, we can choose any number of angles to look at. These are objects without edges, by the way. We can also look at objects with edges where the frames are part of the discourse. So um, how does that change uh, if you, we look at, uh, or we can look at um, different kinds of, like now we're looking at the, um, uh, the way in which the metadata tell us uh, the classification of the objects in terms of what part, uh, what part of Asia uh, they come from, from you know, the Indian subcontinent or the Far East or Southeast Asia. Uh, these are just all examples of how using a data set that was not created for purposes of communities of scholars or people outside of the museum world, we can leverage the power of these data sets to begin, and this is just a demo, but to begin to tell stories about collections as aggregates. Uh, and uh, collections tell really interesting stories. Every collection is a series of, of actions that were intentional actions, typically. A museum doesn't collect at random, it collects because it believes certain things about history, about importance. Um, so what, what do these tools do? They allow us to, to, um, to dive into this uh, world. And uh, Carrarium is a project that's in progress, but it's a, a project that is uh, very much focused on um, enabling those kinds of possibilities. Uh, okay. Now, I want to turn to a different case, which is uh, the example of um, bringing together uh, this world of, this very rich world of data sets, of resources that are available through um, uh, online uh, uh, portals of different kinds. And, um, you know, I'm sure all of you can remember a moment when uh, hotspots were relatively difficult to find. You used to have to go around with your laptop, you know, like looking to see if you could find a hotspot to get on the web, right? Um, or uh, you'd have to f go to a special place, you know, a cafe or a, a library uh, to go online. Well, we now live in a world that is a giant hotspot. And that hotspot includes increasing parts of the natural landscape, uh, which opens up a really interesting question, which is what do we do with a networked natural world? I mean, how might it be possible to think about bringing all the richness of that world of information into the experience of a landscape? Uh, so this is a sketch for a project that we didn't succeed in accomplishing, but I think it, the concept of it is an interesting concept. So there are fantastic databases and open science assets around the field of botany. Uh, there are resources about the structure of seeds, of like herbaria. There's fantastic open science materials about the analysis of plants. There's very rich environmental resources, but those resources don't connect to the experience of actually tra traversing a physical space. So the idea behind this project, which was called Digital, um, uh, digital Ecologies, um, we were working with the Arnold Arboretum, which is a tree collection. It's like a museum collection, except this is a collection of 15,000 trees, living, living trees. Um, and those trees have a history. In fact, the fantastic thing about this project, which uh, is that we were working with an archive that's fully digitized, that tells you the story of every square meter of a public park called the Arbor, Ar Arnold Arboretum, which Harvard administers as a research facility, but that people, ordinary citizens, use as a recreational space. Every single meter is documented from the time of its foundation in the 19th century to the present. We know every tree that has ever lived in every square meter of soil because all those documents were preserved. So the new tree that took its place it also has its own documents. So what can you do with that? That was the question. Could we create a tool that would allow people to somehow experience the richness of that history, the way that this is a curated space, to somehow tell that story on site? That was one proposition. The other proposition was, what are the expressive stories that we can tell with the data sets? How can we use the archive as a storytelling platform, as a platform of, for making arguments? This was an early sketch that was done by a couple of students uh, with my colleague, uh, Yanni Lukisis. Uh, but I wanna show you this as an example, because I mean, maybe it's a little bit more representative. This is a beautiful piece that's documented online if you go to the Life and Death of Data, which is a website uh, that we built. So this is a representation, this is an illustration from a, um, a, a kind of interactive essay that um, is at, located at the website. So this is just an illustration you're looking at. But this is a representation of the entire archive 
of 100 plus years of history from the foundation of the Arboretum, I think it was in the 1870s, to the present using the archival data. But of course, you'll notice okay, it's designed like a tree, right? It's designed like the rings of a tree. We move from the moment of foundation outwards. And what you see as the divisions are months, the difference uh, between different months. And each of those items that's represented in the cone is the moment of planting, when a specific item was put into the landscape at a given time. In the published version of this, each of those data points is linked to a point of argument inside the main text. So the, the, the point of this exercise is not to just pre create a little bit of kind of eye candy using archival data. It was to try to experiment with a genre, and I can just show it to you really quickly. I mean, it'll probably load a little bit slowly, so I'm, I'm kind of terrified, but let's see. Um, maybe it'll be, it'll be okay. It takes a long time to load, that's the only thing. So this is Inyani's published piece. It's an argument, it's a scholarly paper about the history of the Arboretum and the ways in which certain ideologies of collecting and planting were used. This is a recognizable genre of scholarship, except we have integrated, woven together into the fabric of the text, um, these visual, uh, interactive visuals, which actually are literally a publication of the archive. They're an interpretive publication of all of the data from the archive. Uh, um, so, example of knowledge design in practice, of an attempt to try to invent a genre uh, of argument. We can take any moment here and we can look at, you know, um, basically the distribution of plants, the events that were happening. This is a timeline, if you like. But on the other side, we have a standard narrative. But it's a narrative that's threaded and interwoven with elements uh, from this larger uh, story. So you see what I'm getting at. And some of those illustrations are gonna load right in these blanks right here, but uh, we don't have time for that. So I'm gonna go back to my main argument. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> okay. So this brings me to the, the question of the expressive powers of data. I, what I just showed you, I think, was an example of how an approach that looks at data sets, not as just a series of abstract fields, but rather that looks at them as opportunities for creating an expressive structure that makes an argument, that links to another argument, a, a familiar kind of argument that's a historical narrative is something that we've been working on in a number of our projects. And uh, uh, there's several different um, domains we've worked on. One of them, uh, and I'm just gonna touch upon this really briefly before I, um, I wrap up, is an experiment with, that answers the question that I asked before about what about print? How do we want to have those traditional forms of argument and share, knowledge sharing and dissemination that we associate with books and with specialized uh, journal essays, for example? How do we want them to speak differently? How might we want them to interact with these other opportunities for communicating knowledge online or in a variety of media, whether it's recorded sound or it's visuals or it's mo moving pictures or still images? Um, and uh, an experiment that we carried out uh, that's pretty much complete now is a project called Cold Storage, which is, and again, this is something you can visit online, uh, is a combination of a book. The last chapter of the book is a draft of a screenplay for a documentary. The documentary is uh, the navigational system for an archive, an archive that tells the story of one of the world's largest book depositories. It's like a kind of analog server farm. It's like if you took before you had robots to go fetch every book, you created this massive library of Babel and you had humans be the little machine that goes and, and finds these books for readers that are off-site. Uh, this is the story of them. It's a, a series of layered elements that together uh, are woven together to try to tell a story which is about the library as an institution, the relationship between knowledge as ac the activation of knowledge, knowledge as an active presence, knowledge uh, as a feature of uh, the uh, uh, if you like, uh, as, as a process in the present, and the storage 
roles that libraries and similar kinds of institutions of memory and learning have played over the course of their history. It's a stitched and woven together approach that's an experiment. Um, it's an experiment that had a design studio that I, that I taught for a couple of years on the design of libraries, literally with young architects trying to think about what should a library be in the 21st century? What does a reading room look like in a world where we're moving across screens to pay paper and back all the time? Um, as I said, it's also, it was also a, a book, uh, a book that was an experimental book. It was a design-driven book. It's what in the design community is called a uh, a book that was written to the design. The design existed before the book. I had to write exactly a certain number of words. Couldn't be more, couldn't be less. Uh, because that was essential to the argument that the book was making. It's also a card deck, which is used by designers as a game to try to get outside of their conventional thoughts about what a library is today, what a library could be. Uh, the cards actually, the text on the cards is actually, are, are actually in the margins of the book as well. It was a series of student experiments with mapping the space. Um, the uh, project also included um, a series of uh, experiments with the data feeds from the depository because the depository at Harvard not only sends books out to the library, to the reading room, to the readers, but it also scans books. It also sends out packets in digital form. It does both. Um, and of course, it was also a documentary film that was a remaking of a, a famous, a kind of classic library film, Alain René's uh, Toute la mémoire du monde. Okay, and now to conclude, I'm gonna jump forward here, if you will abide with me for just a second. These are all mostly redundant with what I just said. Okay, that's the site. Those are the data feeds. And, drum roll. Um, okay. We're at the Lightbox Gallery. So I, I brought up on a number of um, contexts this question of how we, we weave together information and space, which I think is a really fundamental challenge, not just for architects and designers, but also for our teaching practice, for uh, you know, all kinds of aspects of the world of learning um, and education that we're part of. And so I'm just gonna give you an example, a, a one example uh, that brings together some of the features of Corarium that you already saw. Um, in a physical, a literal physical space, the space is the Harvard Art Museums, the, the top floor of the Harvard Art Museums uh, that were just reopened uh, last year, in October of last year, uh, Renzo Piano building. This gallery is called the Lightbox Gallery. It's a, a gallery that Metalab uh, did the design for. And I think as this film will show you, it has two features that are woven together. One is that every object that's on exhibition on the floors below, this is the top floor of the building, the fifth floor, is represented on the object map on the screen. So instead of seeing a replica of that object, what you see are all of those objects together in an interactive space where there's a projection system on the back where any choice that the visitor makes on that object map, when he pulls up an object on the screen, it changes the visualization on the other side. So Nice interactive game, if you like, but what's the point of it? Well, let me show you what the point of it is because I, th I think it's quite interesting. So what happens when you bring up one of those objects? Now that's an object that presumably you've already seen when you walked up, but what, it, what happens when you click on an object is it brings up the object as a digital object. In other words, it doesn't just bring up a nice big picture, picture, a reproduction. Rather, what it shows you is that this is a digital representation and that actually that object has, is surrounded by a kind of halo of data and information. And this is the way that it's viewed by people inside the museum and outside the museum. Except we usually we don't see the data fields. We don't usually see it as a digital object. We see it as a simulacrum of a physical object. Um, so what's the advantage of, of doing something like this? Well, when you're in the Lightbox Gallery, if you click on any of those fields, the entire object map, map reshuffles itself. Um, so I'm gonna do something a little dangerous here, which is to try to actually show you this. Um, it's dangerous because this is actually running live in the art gallery right now. Um, so whatever I do is gonna cause havoc in the museum. <laughs> um, and, and if somebody activates it, they'll be making trouble for me, right? <laughs> but so it's loading the object map. So here are the 1800 objects that are physically exhibited. We're just sending out API calls to the 
um, the, web, the, the database of the Harvard Art Museums. And you can see we have a, a collection of objects that includes coins, it includes many different kinds of, of uh, objects. And if I pull one up, well, we get just at random here, we could pull up, here we go. So here we see a, a, a particular uh, bodhisattva with two attendants. It's filled out our whole object list. And uh, if we were to choose any, like the date of the object, um, it will immediately reshuffle the, um, the deck to show me where that object lives in the 1800 objects that it's associated with from any number of different perspectives. Data is great from that standpoint. It allows you so many ways into a single object that are not the ways in that you can see in terms of a physical object. But when you are playing with a database that has very rich descriptive fields, you can do a lot of similar kinds of things. But the story doesn't stop there. It of course extends also to a series of other capabilities that I'm gonna show you right now. Hopefully. <laughs> okay, these are examples of the kinds of things that are exposed. Um, I wanna mention, so one of the things that's part of the data record is an automated color analysis. We saw before how color can uh, color analysis can be integrated into a uh, digital record. Um, but of course, when you're taking a sculptural object against a gray background, your color data is extremely mis misleading. Um, and what you're shown here is, of course, the dominant colors are gray. Guess what? That's because the object is a sculptural object. So part of the point here is also to expose the limitations, the way in which every representation is just that. It's a representation. It's not a, an accurate uh, pinpointing of the essence. So what's happening on the other, the other wall, so to speak, when we um, click on an object, when we pull it up? Let's see if it'll behave itself. On the projection screen, what we're seeing, depending on the field that's been chosen, is the database doing something else, which is telling us whatever field I chose, date, period, location, provenance, how many times the object has been visited online, uh, how long it's been in exhibition, I can see where that object I'm looking at fits in a lineage of other objects. Um, now, admittedly, this is not a scholarly project, it's an experience design project, but I think it begins to suggest the power of uh, data sets to do things that go way beyond the normal kinds of operations cognitively that we as interpreters of the cultural record can perform. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>